Hi, I'm Nick from Tabletop Duo, and today you will learn how to play Dark Souls the board game Tomb of Giants core set. Setup. Place the campaign board on the table. Set the spark dial according to the number of players. Place it on the spark dial slot. Separate the encounter cards by level and place them face down on the encounter decks area of the campaign dashboard. Shuffle the events deck and place it face down on the event deck section of the campaign dashboard. Each player chooses a character and places the corresponding model and dashboard in front of them. The thief is good at dodging, the pyromancer is good at magical attacks, and the cleric is good at healing. Give each player a heroic action, an Estus flask and a luck token and place them flipped up on their corresponding locations. Give each player 10 wounds slash stamina tokens. Find the treasures that have character symbols on the back. These are the starting equipment for each character. Place the treasure cards with the hand symbol on the hand section and the card that has the armor symbol on the armor slot. If you have more than two hand items or you have a two-handed weapon represented by this symbol, keep the other cards on the backup slot. Form a deck with all common treasure cards which have the chest symbol and the chosen character's treasure cards. They have a chest and a symbol of the character. Remove all treasures with a blue or red dot or that have the symbol of a character that is not currently playing. Place the deck face down on the treasure deck section of the campaign dashboard. Place the party token on the starting area and now you're ready to learn how to play. Your party's goal is to defeat Nero, the main boss at the end of the encounters track. To do so, you have to face the encounters, fighting enemies and the Black Knight mini-boss, gaining their souls and treasures to level up. When your party is ready to start, Move the party marker to the first space on the encounter track. Draw two cards from the encounter deck matching the symbol on the encounter track. Choose one of the two and place it in the encounter card slot below the party marker. The other card is shuffled back into its deck. In order to complete the encounter, you have to achieve the objective listed here. Some encounters have special rules, which are listed in this section. We'll talk about them later. Place the number of tiles listed in this section in the center of play. For example, this encounter uses one tile and this one uses two. You can use any side of the tile that is not marked with the red skulls. If the encounter uses multiple tiles, arrange them as dictated by the picture. Note that adjacent tiles should be connected by doorway nodes, like this. Next, do the tile setup listed on the right side. The first two red symbols are the nodes where the enemies spawn. Place the indicated enemy models on the spawn nodes. Most encounters have one or more enemies on each spawn node, but some encounters might have enemies on a single node only. For this example, I have a skeleton soldier and a skeleton archer on each red node. The next two purple symbols indicate any terrain tokens you must add to the terrain nodes. For example, for this encounter, I must add a tombstone token to the second terrain node. The first terrain node has no indication, so I can leave it empty. If the setup includes this symbol, it means they must add traps to the tile as well. Shuffle the trap tokens face down and place one face down trap token on each of the tile's nodes, excluding any character start, enemy spawn, terrain, and door nodes. Skip the enemy spawn and the terrain nodes even if they're empty, like in this example. If the encounter uses multiple tiles, there is a unique setup for each tile. Setup 1 is used on tile 1, setup 2 is used on tile 2 and so on. Take the data cards for each enemy in the encounter and leave them near the board. Once you have done the encounter setup, each player chooses a character start node, which are the nodes highlighted in yellow on tile number 1. If a starting node have a tombstone, barrel or chest on them, like in this example, you can only choose the other nodes. Next, choose which character plays first and place the aggro token on that character's model. Now you're ready to battle. During an encounter, enemies and characters on active tiles alternate turns, starting with the enemy models. Enemy models on an active tile activate altogether, but only one character activates during each character activation. Note that this encounter has a special rule that dictates enemies skip their first turn. For the sake of the tutorial, I will ignore this rule. The order in which enemies perform their behavior is determined by the threat level. Enemies with the highest threat level activate first. In this example, the skeleton soldiers activate first, followed by the skeleton archers. Note that if the encounter has multiple tiles, a tile becomes active only if a character is placed on it. A character can only move onto another tile from the doorway nodes. 
Once a tile becomes active, it remains active for the remainder of the encounter. The enemy's data card contains the enemy's behavior. You read them from left to right. The first behavior it performs is the movement, represented by the cross symbol. The number on one of the sides of the cross indicates how many nodes the enemy will move on that direction. Various smaller symbols can appear around the movement symbol, modifying how the enemy moves. This move has the ring symbol, which means that enemies targets the nearest character. If two or more characters are at the same node distance, check if they have the aggro token. If one of the characters has it, that character becomes the target. Otherwise, it will target the character with the highest taunt value. For example, the Pyromancer has a higher taunt level than the Cleric, so he is chosen as the target. The enemy moves one node towards the nearest character. Move the model from its current node to an adjacent node. An adjacent node is any node located directly next to the model's current node, horizontally, vertically, or diagonally. Note that enemies and characters cannot move into nodes that have the chest or the tombstone tokens. If an enemy moves onto the same node as a barrel, discard the token. The skeleton soldier movement also has the push symbol. Each time the enemy with the movement push moves onto a node, move all player characters from that node to an adjacent node that is further away from the source of the push. Note that you cannot push a character or enemy onto a different tile. If the character is pushed against a wall, move the model to one of the side nodes. Also, if the push symbol indicates a number, all characters pushed out of the way are attacked. The symbol indicates the attack range, but the skeleton soldier has an error on the range value of its card. It's actually zero. Movement push attacks have zero range, meaning the enemies need to be on the character's node to perform the attack. You must resolve the enemy attack before continuing the behavior. The targeted character gathers the green dice equal to the symbols shown in the equipment's item's dodge value. In this example, I can gather two dice. Movement push attacks are considered a physical attack. For any physical attack, add a number of dice equal to the targeted character's equipped card's block value, which is the first symbol from left to right. For black symbols, gather black dice, for blue symbols, gather blue dice, and for orange symbols, gather orange dice. Then roll them. If the number of dodge symbols rolled equals or exceeds the dodge difficulty, the character suffers zero damage. A benefit of dodging is that you can move one node into any direction if you wish to, by spending one stamina. Sometimes this is a good move to cut or create distance from an enemy or reposition around the boss. If you decide to do so, add a stamina token to the character dashboard. Stamina is added from left to right. If the dodge roll fails, the character is hit by the attack. Subtract the rolled total from the enemy's damage. If your roll equals or exceeds the attack value, the character suffers zero damage. Otherwise, the character suffers the resulting damage. When a character suffers damage, add one wound token per point of damage received on the character's dashboard. Wounds are filled from right to left. Be careful. If all 10 slots are filled and you receive another wound or stamina token, the character dies and the party is immediately defeated. After the movement push attack, there is a bleed symbol, which is one of the four conditional status of the game. If a character is not able to dodge an attack with a condition symbol, even if the character blocks all damage, place the corresponding condition token on the character's dashboard. When a character has the bleed token and they receive damage, the character suffers two additional damage than the tokens discarded. When a character has the poison token, at the end of their turn, they suffer one damage. When a character has the frostbite token, they recover one less stamina at the start of their turn. And when a character has the stagger token, they must spend one additional stamina when performing an attack. Poison, frostbite and stagger tokens are discarded at the end of the player's turn. I will explain some of these concepts later on. Let's go through the behavior of the skeleton soldier. The skeleton soldier moves towards the closest character, there are two characters at the same distance, and none of them have the aggro token, so the enemy moves towards the pyromancer as it has the highest taunt level. It moves to the pyromancer's node, pushing it into an adjacent node. Because the model is against the wall, it moves to one of the side nodes. The push has a damage value, so the player must resolve the physical attack by rolling the dodge and block dice. The pyromancer fails the dodge roll, but they block one out of two damage. They add a wound token to their character's endurance bar. Because they still failed the dodge, the character receives a bleed token. The first skeleton soldier behavior ends, and now the second skeleton soldier is activated. It moves one node towards the nearest character. Because it did not reach the character, that ends its behavior. Then, the skeleton archers activate. 
one at a time. The first symbol of this enemy's behavior is the sword and shield, which means it will perform a physical attack. If the symbol has a magic symbol instead, it means it will perform a magical attack. This enemy starts by attacking first. The range of the attack is here. This enemy has infinite range, which means it can hit any node on the board. Like on the movement, the symbol on the top right of the physical or magical damage symbol indicates who is the enemy's target. The skull symbol means that it will attack the player character with the aggro token. In this example, the character with the aggro token is the thief. If the symbol is a ring, the target is the character that is the closest to the enemy. In this example, only the thief, which has the aggro token, is hit since the attack does not have the node symbol. The damage value is written inside the physical attack symbol. The skeleton archer deals 4 physical damage. Note that terrain tokens like chest and tombstones and other characters do not block or prevent ranged attacks. After an enemy attacks, you must resolve it before continuing the behavior. Gather the green dice equal to the symbols shown in the equipment items dodge value. In this example I can gather 2 dice. If the attack caused physical damage, add the number of dice equal to the targeted character's equipped card's block value which is the first symbol from left to right. If the attack caused magical damage, add the number of dice equal to the target's equipped card's resist value, which is the second symbol from left to right. Then, roll the dice and resolve as previously explained. In this example, the attack's dodge difficulty is 1, and the character rolled a 1 dodge, so they dodged the attack. After attacking, this enemy's behavior continues. It performs a movement behavior as previously explained, with the exception that this movement has no push behavior. In this case, the skeleton archer moves two nodes away from the character with the aggro token. This move ends the first skeleton archer behavior and the second one activates. It attacks the character with the aggro token, which is the thief, with infinite range, dealing 4 physical damage. The thief rolls the dodge and physical block dice. The dodge roll fails, but the character blocks 1 damage. The player adds the remaining 3 damage to the character's dashboard. Then, the archer moves 2 nodes away from the character with the aggro token. Note that if the enemy is already the farthest away from the character, it stays on the node. Before we go to the character's turn, let me quickly read the behavior of the remaining enemies. The skeleton beast starts its behavior by moving one node towards the closest character. If it reaches the same node as one or more characters, it pushes all characters from that node, dealing 4 damage. This attack has a dodge difficulty of 2. The symbol next to the movement is the repeat symbol. It means this enemy repeats its behavior one more time. The necromancer starts its behavior by doing a magical attack with infinite range to the node that has the character with the aggro token, hitting all player characters inside the target's node. That is because this attack has the node symbol. Otherwise, only the targeted character is hit. This attack has a dodge difficulty of 1. Then it performs a resurrect action. Place a skeleton soldier on the closest enemy spawn node to the player character. If each skeleton soldier model is already on a playing area, ignore this rule. The giant skeleton soldier moves one node towards the closest character, pushing and dealing 2 physical damage to any character on the same node as a giant skeleton. Then it attacks the closest character within one node of range dealing 5 physical damage and pushing the character into another node. This attack has a dodge difficulty of 1. And the giant skeleton archer moves one node in the opposite direction of the closest player character, pushing and dealing 2 physical damage to any characters on the same node as the giant skeleton. Then it attacks the character with the aggro token with infinite range, dealing 5 physical damage and pushing the character into another node. Note that only 3 characters and or enemies can share a node at the same time. If there are already three models on a node, and another model moves onto that node, the players must push one of the three models already on that node. Both enemies have performed their behaviors. It's time for the first player's activation. When a character starts their activation, they recover three stamina. Because the first player is the thief, and it does not have any stamina tokens on their dashboard, nothing happens. Otherwise, remove three stamina tokens from the board. Then, they gain the aggro token. If the player character is not the player with the aggro token, then move the aggro token to that character. Now, the player can swap items between their backup slot and hand slots, which we'll see when the next character activates. The backup slot can hold up to two cards of any type. Then, each other character, with exception of the character playing this turn, can move one node. For example, it's the thief's turn so the Pyromancer and the Cleric may move up to one node. Once these steps are complete, the current active character can move and perform an action, 
or perform an action and then move. Whatever fits best your strategy. In this example, the thief wants to attack the skeleton soldier. To attack, the character needs to be in weapons range. An equipment card's range determines the base range from which you can attack enemies or assist allies. This weapon has zero range, so the character needs to be on the same node as the enemy. Therefore, let's start by moving first. Characters have one free node move which is called walk. Like enemies, you can move to any adjacent node, horizontally, vertically or diagonally. Like enemies, you cannot move into a node with a gravestone or a chest. If a character moves onto the same node as a barrel, you discard the token. The first time a player character moves onto a node with a face down trap token, flip that trap token. If the token is not blank, the characters must attempt to dodge or suffer the damage. A trap's damage cannot be blocked. The symbol on the left indicates the damage, and the symbol on the right indicates the dodge value. Because the Paramancer failed the dodge, they take 3 damage. Discard the token once it's flipped. Note that traps don't affect enemies and are not flipped if an enemy moves onto the same node. To get to the skeleton soldier, the thief moves one node. You can move additional nodes by spending one stamina token per node you move into. Now that the thief is in weapons range, let's talk about the character's actions. The first action you can do is attack. During an activation, a character can do one attack with each weapon they have on their hand slots. The thief has a shield in one hand and a bandit knife in the other. The player chooses one of the weapon's attack options. The first number represents the attack's stamina cost. The black, blue or orange symbols with a number indicates the number and color of the dice roll for the attack. For example, this weapon has two attack options. The first option costs zero stamina and the player rolls one black die for damage. The second option costs three stamina and the player rolled two black dice for damage. For this example, the thief will use its second attack option, spending three stamina and rolling two black dice, resulting in two damage. In general, Weapons cause physical damage and players will subtract the target's block value from the damage total. Spells or elemental weapons cause magical damage instead and are identified by this yellow symbol near the dice symbol. If so, players have to subtract the target's resist value from the damage total. If the enemy's block or resist value equals or exceeds the damage total, the enemy suffers zero damage. Otherwise, place the number of wound tokens beside the enemy model equal to the damage it suffered. If the total number of wound tokens on the enemy equals or exceeds its health, the enemy is defeated. Remove the model and the wound tokens from the tile. Note that some weapons have attack options with special abilities. This symbol is called Shaft, meaning that this weapon cannot be used against targets at range 0. Attacks with the node symbol targets all characters on a single node within range. Make the attack roll once for all enemies. When the move has the Shift icon, the characters may move up to the number of nodes shown. If the symbol appears before the dice symbols, the character can move before rolling the dice. This movement is free of cost and does not replace the character's options to move during their activation. Attacks with the repeat symbol allows the character to perform the attack up to the number of times shown on the symbol. Extra attacks do not have to target the same enemy and do not cost additional stamina. If a weapon card has the two-handed symbol and the card is placed in a hand slot, the other hand slot must be empty. Note that some shields can be used with two-handed weapons if it's written in the card. Some attacks inflict conditions on enemies. Bleed and Poison work the same way as previously explained. Enemies with a Frostbite token reduce the value of their move symbols by 1, and enemies with a Stagger token reduce the value of their attack symbols by 1. Players can also use their actions to interact with gravestones or chests when they are in an adjacent node. When you do so, Flip the token to the other side, and no other player can interact with it. If a character spends the action to interact with a tombstone, flip it and look at the top card from the treasure, event or encounter deck, then return it to either the top or bottom of the deck. If a character spends the action to open a chest, flip it to the open side, draw a card from the treasure deck and place it in the inventory area of the campaign board. You can also spend their action by interacting with levers and torches when a character is on the same node as them. The lever is used during encounter objectives, and the torch can be placed on a character's dashboard or removed from it and placed onto their current node. When a character places a torch on their dashboard, they also gain the aggro token. While the torch is on their dashboard, other characters cannot gain the aggro token. Before we move to the enemy's activation, during combat players can also use their character's tokens. The first one is the Astus Flask. At any time during their turn, 
a character can flip the Estus Flask to remove all stamina and wound tokens from their endurance bar. Characters also have a luck token. At any time a character can flip their luck token to re-roll one die in their attack, block or dodge roll. And finally, characters also have a heroic action. At any time during their turn, a character can flip their token to use the action. The heroic action can be found in your character's dashboard and they're fairly straightforward. Flipped tokens cannot be used again until the party rests at the bonfire or they are replenished by an encounter card reward. After the first player's turn, it's time for the enemy's turn. Once the enemies play their behavior, their turn ends. Play then proceeds to the next player to the left of the player who played the previous turn. Let's assume the next player character is the cleric. The character recovers 3 stamina, but because they don't have any stamina tokens on the character dashboard, nothing happens. Then they gain the aggro token. The cleric wants to heal the thief by using the sacred chime. The chime is on the backup slot, therefore it cannot be used in combat unless swapped with an item equipped on the hand slot. Because at the beginning of each character's activation you can swap items from the backup slots with one from the hand slot, the cleric does so. The chime has two healing options, and the cleric wants to use option 2, which by spending 3 stamina, one character within range gains 3 health. Since the thief is within range, 2 nodes away, the cleric does not need to use its movement action. The cleric adds 3 stamina tokens to their dashboard and uses the chime, recovering 3 health points from the thief. The thief removes up to 3 wound tokens from their dashboard. Now it's time for the enemy to activate and the encounter continues. The party wins the encounter by completing the objective. Some encounter objectives and special rules are self-explanatory, like kill all enemies, but some might have more complex objectives. If the objective is survive, all characters must avoid being killed for a set number of turns listed on the card. Use the timer tracker to track the turns. If the objective is exit, all characters need to be on the node indicated by the exit symbol for the encounter to end. And if the objective is occupy, at least one character have to end a set number of turns on a specific node. You can track this by placing a wound token by the side of the playing area whenever a character ends their turn on the node. Note that tokens do not have to be placed in consecutive turns and can be played by any character that ends their turn on the node. Now let's go through some special rules keywords. If the encounter has onslaught, each tile begins the encounter as active. We'll see more about that later. If the special rule is darkness, you can only attack enemies on the same node or an adjacent node. If it's timer, if the timer marker reaches the value shown on the event card, resolve the effect listed. If the special rule is respawn, place additional models as shown on the encounter card. If there are insufficient enemy nodes, use the corresponding enemy tokens. And finally, if the special rule is trial, if you complete that extra objective, you will get additional rewards, as listed on the encounter card. Note that trial is an optional objective and is not mandatory to complete an encounter. If your party successfully complete an encounter, remove all tokens from each character's endurance bar. Then, the party gains any rewards listed on the encounter card. Follow what it says in the reward section. If you receive souls, add the corresponding number of souls to the souls cache. If the reward lists a specific treasure, search for it in the treasure deck, place it in the inventory, and then shuffle the treasure deck. Some encounters reward players with a shortcut. Place the shortcut token on the encounter card. We will explain what it does in a couple of minutes. Also, if the encounter has barrels, roll a black die for each remaining barrel in the game and gain a number of souls equal to the result of the dice roll. After gaining the rewards, tilt the encounter card 90 degrees. Then draw a card from the events deck. There are three type of event cards. If it has the immediate symbol, resolve it and discard the card. If a card with the consumable symbol is drawn, one player places it in their character's dashboard. The card will dictate when its rules come into effect and how to resolve them. If the card has the rendezvous icon, place it below the next non-boss space on the encounter track. You can only have one rendezvous card on an encounter, so if a space already has a rendezvous card and another card would be placed there, discard the existing card. For example, players have received as an encounter reward a rendezvous card. If the next encounter space is the miniboss, add it to the next one. They draw another event card because they completed the previous encounter. It's also a rendezvous card, so they replace the one they just added with the new one. 
After playing the event card, players can exchange any number of equipment cards between their dashboards and or the inventory. Now players must decide if they want to move to another encounter or to go to the bonfire tile to buy equipment, level up or rest. If the party chooses to attempt the second encounter, move the party token, then draw two new encounter cards matching the symbol listed on the encounter and do as previously explained. If the party goes to the bonfire, place the party token on the bonfire slot. Turn the spark dial one number. Flip all Estus, Heroic Action, and Luck Tokens to the ready side, and return each encounter card to its normal orientation. Then you can do any of the following actions. If you want to purchase treasures, draw the top 4 cards from the treasure deck and place them face up in the slots next to the deck. Players can purchase any number of these cards by spending 1 soul from the souls cache per card. Equipment cards have stats requirements that must be met for a character to use them. For example, to equip a winged spear, a character must have 20 strength and 22 faith. Any character who meets the stats requirements can equip the item if they wish. You can upgrade your character's stats by leveling up. To level up, you must spend souls to increase one of your stats. Increasing a base stat to tier 1 costs 2 souls, to increase a tier 1 stat to tier 2 costs 4 souls, and from tier 2 to tier 3 costs 8 souls. When you increase a stat, Flip the stats token so the bright side is up. Each stat is upgraded individually. Sometimes you will find treasures that are equipment upgrades. They enhance other equipment cards. Each weapon and armor equipment card has a slot showing how many upgrades the equipment can hold. For example, the winged spear can hold two upgrades. Weapon upgrades provide bonuses to weapon cards and armor upgrades provide bonuses to armor cards. Weapon and armor upgrades can be freely added or removed while resting at the bonfire. Players can also exchange equipment cards between their dashboards and or the inventory. Once the party is done visiting the bonfire, place the party token on the first encounter space. You must complete the encounters again in order to progress. By replaying encounters, you can collect the rewards by completing them again, grinding a little bit of more souls and treasures. If you have an encounter with a shortcut token in it, instead of returning to the starting space of the encounter track, the party can instead choose to be placed on the shortcut token allowing them to skip early encounters. If any character dies or the party fails to complete the objective, the party is defeated. When that happens, do the steps previously mentioned on the bonfire. Decrease the sparks dial by 1. Place all souls tokens from the soul cache, even if it contains souls from multiple encounters, on the encounter card that the players failed. The party can retrieve the souls by successfully completing the encounter where the souls are. Be careful! If the sparks dial reaches 0, the characters can no longer rest on the bonfire, and the next time a character is defeated, the game is lost. Continue clearing encounters and upgrading equipment and leveling up. When the party token reaches the space with the Black Knight icon, add the Black Knight encounter card and do the setup. Place a mini boss tile on the table. The mini boss tile has this symbol marked on it. Place the character's models on the entry nodes beside the door. Then, place the aggro token on one of the characters and place the mini boss icon on the mini boss spawn node with its front arc facing the door. Get the Black Knight health dial and set it to max health, placing it nearby. Get the Black Knight data and behavior cards. Next, get the boss treasure cards. They have a treasure symbol with a red dot here and the boss's silhouette at the back and place them nearby. Now, let's set up the boss behavior deck. Separate the standard behavior cards from the heat up behavior cards. Take a number of random standard behavior cards equal to the number stated on the boss stats card. The Black Knight behavior deck is composed of 4 cards. Shuffle the behavior deck and place it face down next to the board. The boss data card includes the same information as enemy data cards plus the boss unique characteristics. The threat level, block value, resist value and starting health all function the same way they do on the enemy data cards. Each boss has a special ability. For the Black Knight, at the end of a character's turn, if they made one or more attacks against the boss that did not cause any wounds, the character suffers the stagger status condition. And the heat up symbol indicates when the boss introduces new attacks to its behavior when the health threshold is reached. For example, the Black Knight heats up when it reaches 10 health points. But we will talk about the heat up behavior later. Just like in regular encounters, the boss activates first, then the next player activates and so on. At the start of the boss's activation, flip its topmost behavior card and place it in a discard pile, face up beside the behavior deck. That card will be used to represent the boss's behavior during this activation. 
Bosses do not have a single attack range or dodge value like other enemies. Instead, each behavior card has its own attack range and dodge value. You read the card the same way as regular enemy cards, but these cards have symbol unique to boss encounters. Let's use this behavior as an example. The boss attacks with a range of 2, all the nodes on its right and front arcs, dealing 4 physical damage to all the characters inside each node hit. This attack has a dodge difficulty of 2. If a character is not able to dodge the attack, they gain a stagger token. Then, the boss moves one node towards the character with the aggro token. When a boss moves towards a character, turn the boss so that the center of its front arc faces an adjacent node that is the closest to the target. Like this. This movement has the push symbol, so our character will get pushed if the boss moves onto the same node as the character. You must move the character to an adjacent node that is the same arc of the movement. If there are no available nodes in the same arc due to a wall, the character can move to any adjacent node touching the wall instead. Nodes that touch the boundaries of an arc are valid options. If a boss behavior requires it to move away from a character, turn the boss so the center of its back arc faces an adjacent node that is farther from the character. The boss then backs up onto that node without changing its facing. As you can see, the green areas indicate the arcs that the boss attacks. The red arc indicates the boss's weak spot, and the black arc indicates the arcs that the boss doesn't attack. If an attack does not have the green areas, it means the boss will hit either the nearest or the aggro target within range, without needing to be facing them. If during a character's activation, the boss's last played behavior card has a red area, positioning your character on a node that directly faces the arc and performing an attack, grants an extra black die for damage. A character can be in more than one arc, if it's on a node along the arc line. This makes it easier to gain the weak arc bonus, but it also means the character will be targeted by attacks against either arc. When moving to the same node as the boss, the character must remain in the arc they were before moving. If the character was in two arcs before moving, choose which one of the two arcs to move into. When a character on a boss's node would move one node as part of the walk or run, they can instead choose to move around the boss to an adjacent arc. When the boss's behavior deck is empty at the start of a boss's activation, pick up the discard pile and turn it face down without shuffling the cards to create the boss's behavior deck. Then combat continues normally. When the boss's health is reduced to its hit up point or below, the boss will hit up. Take one random hit up behavior card and shuffle it in the behavior deck. Players will now need to relearn the boss's attack pattern. Hit up cards are strong, so be careful. After the players defeat the Black Knight, add the Black Knight treasure cards to the inventory and any other rewards listed in the encounter card. For the treasure deck, add the transposed treasure cards for each character playing, the legendary treasure cards, and all Gravelord Needles treasure cards. Increase the spark dial by one and give each character an ember token. Flip the Black Knight's encounter cards face down to reveal the bonfire icon. For the remainder of the game, when the characters rest at the bonfire, place the party token on this space instead of going back to the starting point. Once you get to the last campaign encounter, you will fight Gravelord Nido. The setup is done the same way, but when fighting the main boss, you use the two boss tiles. Models can move freely between tiles, as if they were a single large tile. When the party defeats Nido, they win the game. And that's how you play Dark Souls Tomb of Giants core set. If you're enjoying Dark Souls board game, check these other videos. Thanks for watching and see you next time.